How do you spell love? Everyone answers. T-I-M-E. Let the kids figure that out for a second. How do you support the others around you in your life? How do you, how do you express love to them? Love that, that fosters connections, that fosters the relationships um, that you have. There was a, an article that cited a study from 2018, and it said that on average, American families spend 37 minutes of quality time together per day. 37 minutes of quality time together per, per day. Now, that particular statistic might not be true for you, but if it's not that statistic, then it's probably some other, other factor. We all have those those cringe moments where we get awareness of our failures in our, as far as our relationship track record, don't we? Whether it's the, the relationships and the failures from a parent to a child, or from your children to your parents, or within marriages, or among friends, or, or neighbors, or others. So we've traveled to this area here as we talk about relationships where we often carry a lot of regrets or a lot of regrets are brought up as we talk about the subject. Honestly, these words from Jesus certainly drive us to despair of coming and thinking, wow, I'm pretty good. What's not to like about me as a husband or a father or a friend or a neighbor? Because God's word here... It just makes so clear how many failures we have, how far short we fall of his good expectations and will. It lays out how ugly our sin is and how much it hurts the others around us. And any inklings of being judged good in God's sight by our record are just, are just blasted away. But listen, um, God's word, Jesus' own voice, also then directs us right back to himself. Go ahead and project up for us the next slide. This is from the paragraph just before the words we read. If you were here with us last Sunday, you heard Jesus say these words in Matthew 5. Do not think that I came to abolish the law, but I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. What does that mean for you? That means Jesus was the perfect son. Jesus was the only perfect neighbor and friend, and brother, and he, he did it he did it for us. And then after that life, what did he do? Um, amazing, he, he went and then he took all the punishment and suffering for all of our failures in relationships, where we have hurt the other people around us. He was punished in our place. Look to him. He, he is your Savior, who credits you that perfect life he lived in your behalf who takes away your punishment and all the consequences from your sin eternally and gives to you eternal life. There is no greater love. There is no greater love. Now he calls us, as we look at this section, as, as blood-bought children, as, as raised to life, children of God who, who have his love, who know his love, to share that love with the others around us. This section has so much as far as practical, concrete ways how to show love to the people with whom we interact in our everyday life all around. And also this, it has, it has encouragement to squash our sinful desires which would, which would hurt the other people that God has placed around us. All the while we keep in view His love, His love that picks us up, that cleans us off, and sends us on our way with new strength to carry out this purpose of loving those around us. So, go ahead, click to our next one. Look, look then to verses 21 and 22. Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say. And, and what's that bringing out? That's actually bringing out that people had a distorted view of God's law when it, when it comes to this part. They, they had twisted it. They had, they had twisted it into something that was easier to keep than, than what God had down. And, and people have a tendency to do this. Because we don't like to acknowledge how far short we fall of God's good expectations. So we're tempted to place distinctions between sins. 
And so the thinking back then, and it still happens today in our world, when it comes to the fifth commandment is, well, well, that's just about murder. And as long as I don't murder anyone, then I'm all good. Um, the world's view is like this. Well, I have the right to be angry, certainly. You can't expect me not to get angry. I mean, they have it coming. The fools. In God's view, Jesus shows us anger. And when it ends up lashing out in words that are hurting others and are attacking others, are actually belong in the same company as, as murder. It's not distinctions. It's, it's sin. It hurts. It's, it's wrong. Period. Our Lord cares about more, you see, than just the physical, than just someone being slugged in the face. And the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. God knew that wasn't true. And there are mental and there are emotional wounds that are caused by, by words and by anger that's unleashed upon people. Who hasn't been guilty of anger? Even the littlest among us, right? Even the littlest throw their tantrums and shout at their parents or other, other children and, and probably have pushed and, and hurt others too. So, so remember, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, He rescues us. Look on. Um, go ahead and click another one. Jesus takes us to another example, this time with re relation to the Sixth Commandment. But the same kind of thing was going on. What was the, the world's distorted view? Well, the world was thinking, what's the big deal? If I look at someone, a, a woman, a man, lustfully, it's just, I, I'm, not, I'm not acting. It's just a little eye candy, we, we hear people say today. And today, modern technology presents, pre presents additional layers of complication to this distorted view on, um, of this. What's wrong, someone says, with acting out my, my sinful fantasies? Well, they wouldn't say sinful. What's wrong with acting out my fantasies when it's an online game or when it's just looking at, at images of people on a screen? Again, there were assumptions made in the past and they're still made today that the breaking of the Sixth Commandment, people think, well, that's just when I actually engage in sex outside of marriage, <laughs> either before marriage or with someone else who is married, and so it's, it's cheating. God wants you to see, you see Jesus' explanation, you've already broken God's law with each lustful look. Broken that law and, and something wrong already in the, in the heart. Our Lord cares about the whole person, physical, emotional, spiritual. And that's true for you, as well as the people that walk by you, as well as the people on the screen, or the, screen, the screens that you hold in front of you. God wants you to think how such sinful looks like lust actually, that, that hurts people. People are exploited and used. In some cases, people are even trafficked and enslaved. Real people hurt. And the person being hurt also is the one looking at the images. God wants to keep you and me free from distorted, faulty views about his gift of sex. He wants us to see that, that he talks a lot about, about it, about sex, but it's in his book, it's, it's within the, the beauty of a, a married relationship between husband and wife. Then it really is, it really is good. <coughs> Following this topic through further, Jesus gives, I think it's another slide here. Yeah, Jesus gives us, in verses 29 and following, an answer to a common excuse. Someone says, but it's my eye. It's my eye that leads me into these sinful lusts. And Jesus makes clear, the problem isn't your eye. The problem is, is deeper. The problem is with the heart, on the sinful heart, the, the sinful flesh with its, its desires. And so Jesus' point isn't to mutilate our bodies, right? Because the problem isn't really with the eye or with the hand. Jesus' point is to warn us about this extreme danger. Jesus' point is to tell us to see the catastrophic potential. Sin left unaddressed where the sinful nature is left unchecked and allowed to just go on, threatens to enslave a heart. So, 
So don't make excuses about sin. Fight it. Fight it with the love of God that you have. And no, fight it with the truth of God that you have. And you know, think of practical ways to help fight such temptations. If you have a hard time fighting against sinful temptations like lust, then find ways, practical ways, to put up barriers to cut off the temptation. And so get software and get filters in place on your, on your devices and set up other practical ways of having some accountability with a fellow Christian to help guard you against this. And parents among us, God has given us the responsibility to take care of our children. And so software and filters are absolutely essential for helping, for helping protect them. Statistics show in our culture that the average age that children are exposed to pornography, their first exposure is between ages 8 to 11, and sometimes even younger. But there are things you can do to help protect against that. The group um, Conquerors Through Christ was up at um, our, our worker training college this last week, Martin Luther College. And if you look back to archive live streams of the chapels, so there, there's one in the evening and there's one of the morning ones, they give a, a, wonderful, a wonderful presentation of how to have a positive talk about the temptations and sins that attack us. Um, you'll see if you look at the Conquerors Through Christ website, all sorts of materials that can help to encourage and direct, um, to correct if needed, or to give instruction. There are materials there for every age, for parents to help teach their children at different ages and help guard them against the temptations we face in our culture all around us. And the message is consistently there, pointing back to Jesus for forgiveness for our, our past. As we face the kind of temptations that inundate the world around us. We want to be a church, a group of believers that are here to help each other. So if you struggle with temptations in this way, or it, with some other temptation, then no, you can come and talk to me for encouragement and counsel and support. And there are other ways that there are, are support provided, things like Christian Family Solutions, all because eternal life with our God in heaven forever is too precious of a thing to lose out on for some short-term satisfaction that really will not satisfy at all in the end. Jesus, Jesus brings us ultimate joy. Okay, in verses 31 to 32, related still to, to family and marriage, you see another place where the world's view has gotten off, and it was off back then too. The world says, what's the big deal if we get divorced? Everybody does it, right? It happens all the time. Even thousands of years ago, there was in, in some this view of marriage as, as not that big of a deal. It can be easily discarded. Jesus counters this with God's truth. God cares. God cares about the stability and the security and the well-being of individuals, of family units, of society as a whole. Think through how many people are affected if there's this well, it doesn't really matter view of marriage. I'm not talking about um, where there's, there are divorces where God says there's a reason. One person has broken the marriage by unfaithfulness or desertion. But this is a, it doesn't matter, I don't care about this, I'm just going to get a divorce type view. There's a secular study, this was interesting to see, that was done by an Oxford social anthropologist named J.D. Unwin. He researched a total of 86 different civilizations and cultures. That's a lot. Um, central to his conclusions was the finding, the highest flourishing of a culture. The highest flourishing of culture took place when two factors were found together. Are you curious what they are? Two factors. Here they are. <coughs> Premarital chastity, so in simpler terms, waiting for that gift that God has for marriage for, for marriage. And then this, a view of absolute monogamy. In other words, simpler terms, there's a lifelong commitment along with marriage vows. Highest level of flourishing of society when those are present. And when those are abandoned, and then people are just seeking out sexual pleasure in any way that they desire, just kind of chasing after here and there, the, the society's collapsed. 
Um, within, he, he noted, within three generations, uh, he labeled this a dead level, and the cultures were usually at that point taken over or conquered by another civilization, by another people. Now, we don't need a study like that to prove the truth of God's word, but something like that does point us back to the wisdom of God. If a spouse decides to divorce the, their spouse, when there isn't scriptural reason, when they, they haven't done anything to break the marriage. Think of what they put that spouse, that innocent spouse through, and if there are any children in it, what they put the, that whole family through. Unnecessary upheaval, trauma, lives torn apart. Psychologists have noted where, um, where this takes place, sometimes a person has deeper grief than when they've lost a husband or a spouse through through death. It's loss either way, but in this case, there, there's also the added feeling sometimes of betrayal or rejection or sometimes misplaced shame. And that's the one really, if you look at Jesus' words, he really helps us there. Jesus explains, if people don't know the facts, the wrong spouse, the wrong spouse, sorry, the one who has been wronged, is sometimes viewed unfairly as guilty by others, as if they've done something. The translation that we have here um, at the end of verse 32 um, brings this out, and, and a lot of English translations miss this. Um, you see there, and um, so except for causes her, the one that's the innocent spouse, to be regarded as an adulteress. It's not fair. They, they're the innocent one. But sometimes people that don't know the facts look and that's what happens. You see, our, our God really cares. He doesn't want people to be hurt in these ways. Think about a big picture. Think about all that Jesus is talking about here in this section. We're spending a lot of time, he spends a lot of time, talking about practical ways that God's commands intersect with our human lives. And in all this we see, our Lord cares. His commands are there to protect us. Now the part we didn't cover, go ahead and click one more. We're going to go back to verses 23 and 24, and you notice 33 through 37 another time. Okay, we got too much here. We'll cover those another time. But going back to 30, 23 to 30, 24, I saved for last, and here's, the why I saved, here's why I saved it for last. We've got this topic, blessed with relationship wisdom, and yet while we have this topic, blessed with relationship wisdom, we realize that we are not going to have perfect homes. And, sorry to say it, you're not going to have a perfect RV camp for these weeks ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and so, here, Jesus gives us the way to handle when we've, when we've failed and we've wronged others. He depicts a scene, and he puts us into the scene. So picture yourself in the scene, and, and you're going to worship God, and, and when you go to worship God, you realize, oh, come to the realization, there's this way that I've wronged someone. I've, I've hurt someone else by my sin. Now look what priority level Jesus places on, on what he, he says to do next. He says, then, then go. Then go and be reconciled. He, he's pointing us to the importance of when we, when we recognize the way that we have wronged someone to... To, to take steps, right? To, to go to, to them, to, to acknowledge how much our wrongs can hurt other people. Now, remember what the individual was doing in Jesus' description when that, re that realization comes. What was the individual doing? Going to, to worship. This makes sense, right? At worship, we are encounter encountering our God, right? We are hearing His truth. His truth, again, brings us to see our failures. His truth also, at the same time, always brings to us the news of his unfailing love and his forgiveness. This truth is what then enables us to be able to step up and go to the people that we've wronged and, and admit our sin, right? This is kind of like a, a recipe for this, right? Uh, if you want to use those terms. It's what enables us to be honest and to admit our sin and to go to those that we have wronged to do what we can to, to help in healing. Saying I'm sorry. 
and if there are ways that we can correct the wrong we've done to, to do that as well. Okay. In light of all that our Savior tells us here, we realize the ways that we've hurt the others around us. And I said at the outset, when we talk about relationships, we often, it often brings up a lot of regret. So let's do this to close. Let's go to the assurance of the healing and the peace that we have in Jesus, with Jesus. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. He is the, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. If we confess our sins, God is faithful, and God is just, and God forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. No one who hopes in you, Lord, will ever be put to shame. This is our trust. This is our confidence. So as God's dear child through faith, be assured, you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, namely our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption, our salvation. Amen.